Hail and hello, everyone. Welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, a Midgard Musings production. Join me, Jesse, your host, as we discuss random heathen-related topics and various other things in an attempt to find where, if any, heathen worldviews can be applied. You can support this podcast by clicking on the Linktree link in the description or show notes. You can also follow me on all of my social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and become a patron on Patreon. Join me every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central on all major podcast streaming platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and many, many. If you wish to have your voice heard on the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, you can dial in to 615-671-9832. Thank you all once again for listening to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Enjoy and hail to you all. All right, folks. Hail and welcome back to uh, this week's episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, uh, brought to you by Anchor, Spotify, or wherever it is that you, um, there we go, wherever it is that you catch your podcasts. So um, appreciate you all coming back, being here this week. Got some guests lined up for us today who have an online and grassroots group um, in the southwestern Ohio area, as I recall. Um. I'm going to need to pull up my handy dandy. Yeah, Southwest Ohio. So um, we're going to be bringing on two folks, um, Heidi Beth and Roger. These uh, these folks run the Runestone Heathens of uh, Southwest Ohio. It's a Facebook group. It's a Facebook community. But as I understand it, they also have um, very regular, you know, grassroots type stuff you know they, they they do things with people in uh a very you know grassroots sort of approach on things and so if you're not on facebook and you're hearing about this for the first time i'm gonna be talking with them today and try to get as much information about you know what they're doing um i i have been corresponding back and forth with them a bit uh, via email um and another really neat thing um that at least roger is involved with is um being a, a scald and finding the place in modern times for uh, the scald. So he plays a lyre or lyre, whatever the, the, the stringed kind of harp instrument that you see, like something like that over there that you see on the, in the background. Um, but yes, um, hope, hoping to have some of, of his, um, you know, talent displayed here on the podcast today and, and just talk about, you know, that and, some else of what they're doing in the Southwest Ohio area. So without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome in Roger and Heidi Beth of the Runestone Heathens of Southwestern Ohio. This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, right, folks. Well, we are here um, with Roger and Heidi Abney, who uh, are first time guest on the podcast but as i've come to learn long time lurkers supporters viewers of, of midgard musings and now the podcast so uh, welcome to the show uh, roger and, and heidi thank you hail and well met jesse <laughs> i appreciate that appreciate that uh so it was great i actually got reached out to um by heidi over an email i guess it was uh you know last week or sometime and we've kind of corresponded back and forth and you guys gave me a little bit of your background, but we were just talking a bit um, offline about our backgrounds, respectively, and I think that would be a neat place to start for the listeners and the viewers, if you don't mind, just kind of rehashing some of it. I know it was mostly me telling you about what's going on up here, but you had some neat things to say about what you guys are doing in your neck of the woods, which is what Southwest Ohio is that right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. In the, we're in 
we're just south of Dayton. So we're kind of in the Cincinnati Dayton area. And we have, um, well, what I was mentioning was about two and, uh, two and a half years ago, we had decided we were ready to start trying to find others in the area who were heathen that we could practice with because there wasn't, we knew some old school heathens. We have some members who uh, of our local community group, Runestone Heathens of Southwestern Ohio that have been practicing heathens since the 70s and 80s. Mm. So we knew these older members who had been through a lot and seen the changes that Asatru and heathenry have been through over the years, but finding people that we could get together with and, and learn from and meet, there just wasn't really anything in the area. There's a vibrant pagan community in the area, but an actual Northern European Germanic um, religious based group there wasn't really anything so yeah yeah we we kind of started um i i listen when i was i've i've only been heathen for maybe pushing three years but i was i was norse wiccan before that everybody laughs and turn the podcast off but don't do that <laughs> i was gonna uh, say that you you just opened up a a, a follow-up question for me then because what is even that is would be my question but go ahead i'll we'll come back to it <laughs> okay yeah. Um, so, you know, it was basically through rune work that I became interested in like full on heathenry because I was already Norse Wiccan mm -hmm. and started getting heavy into the runes and decided it's time to leave the Wiccan ritual forms behind and take on, learn this new form of, of ritual. Um, so, I was listening to a lot of the Ravens call, uh, Eric Shervin, to, yeah. uh, when I when I was uh, first learning, because uh, he had a lot of good information. He's a great podcast. Uh, yeah, I've had him on the show a couple of times, and he's been a good friend of mine for years now. So that's great to know that you found him and that he kind of helped you segue into this path. Yeah, yeah. I, I was listening to his podcast, and that's how I learned about yours and started listening to yours, too around the same time and uh so he was talking you know as a video that's titled something like what do i do if there's no heathens in my area mm -hmm. and he gave this this blueprint of you know start a facebook group advertise it start having moots take pictures at your moots it don't matter if you're the only one there take pictures post it let let people know that you're there so uh having heidi in doing that was a major blessing because having both of us it, it attracted a, like different kinds of people Heidi attracts people that I wouldn't attract and vice versa mm -hmm. but we we followed that that prescription that he gave there and we've been fortunate that the gods have blessed its hamingya mm -hmm. and, and and grown it absolutely yeah. absolutely we've been fortunate but we've also put in a lot of work we've it's runestone it's taken a lot of yes. work runestone mm -hmm. heathens was founded in um october of 2020 wow. and yep yeah, two years we've just been doing it two years i know when people find that out they're like oh, we thought you were around forever no i've been pagan myself and then switched to heathen a few years ago but pagan for 28 years so I've been walking this path for a very long time, but the the call of the Norse gods was one I resisted for a little while because as a woman, it can be a little intimidating to become heathen. Hmm. And it, it's there's it's so masculine in its perception. And yeah. that was one of the things I really set out to try and change. And so I've done a lot of my focus on making people more comfortable with the feminine side of it. And um, I, I, I started a group this year for women, for magic practitioners of the Northern European traditions. So I have a, a group that focuses specifically on feminine magic. Mm -hmm. And that was, so like you said, we, we tend to attract different aspects of people to the group and then when they get together they realize they have things in common mm -hmm. and 
so it 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 has been it's been a really good thing for us but it is definitely work we we also when we started that group were fortunate to have people who have been in the community for a long time take an interest in what we were doing yes and that yeah. really helped to sink our roots into the earth yep so. oh i'm sure because like to you to your point when you were saying that some of the people that you knew who have been doing this you know, since the 70s and 80s, before there was the internet, before there was any of, you know, all your research was in books, there was no, you couldn't just Google something if you had a question, it was, it was real, you know, nose to the grindstone, boots on the ground, real work to, to, to studying and, and learning of things. And so now you've got people like that, that are seeing, I guess, a fresher, newer perspective that it, it would, I'm sure, draw some interest and attention from the veterans of the industry, as it were, right? Yeah, people that have been around and seen things and it's, you know, it's I don't know, of course, I don't have that many years under my belt just from living. Uh, I was born in 84, but just knowing the progression of heathenry, like I, I've heard crazy things about the way it was in the 90s. And then the is the, the uh the insertion of the growth of, of the modern of the also true movement, you know, from like in the mm -hmm. 70s, I guess it was um, and, and how it kind of turned into i always always looked at because we when you were mentioning before about like norse wick and i always thought that also true was was that it, it was wicca with a norse veneer or or you know they they, they follow much of the the wiccan wheel uh for their celebrations their holy tides instead of maybe leaning more towards the the, the more historical yeah reckoning of of when holy tides were kept keeping in mind right. also the regional differences of you know how the Swedes did it versus how the Norwegians did it versus how the Danes would have done it or the Icelanders or you know all of those folks up there and then then of course you have mainland Germania the the Saxons and all of that too so it's it, it becomes quite the the uh you do you you, you really get into the minutia of it all you get into the the nitty-gritty and you're like well where do I fit in and that's oh, what you kind of made it like, well, here you can just do everything and be, I think, you know. <laughs> I think that was part of the growing pains for for early also true when you go back to like the founding of the troth and things like that. A lot of the people were trained in Wicca already. And so naturally those practices are going to kind of color what they're doing in a in a more reconstructionist religion. Mm -hmm. So um but but yeah, I mean, it, it's something that scholarship evolves on. And the more that you study reading things like H.R. Ellis Davidson and uh, yeah. like Rudolf Symek and things like that, you you there's there's plenty to, to put together a coherent and vibrant practice without having to lean on ceremonial magic and things like that although i still use a hammer hollowing so <laughs> hey if that's where if that's what works for you right um i i've i've been an advocate of if it works for you then you know you're how you heathen how anyone heathens whether it's a individual solitary practitioner or whether it's in a group setting whether it be a kindred or tribe or whatever you know um your your collective is called um whatever works for you you know, it's not going to work for everybody. It's not it's not universal in that in that way. So and I think a lot of it, too, comes from doing things, figuring it out. And, yep, that worked or not. Nah, that, that really didn't work. So, well, let's try something different and kind of being evolved, you know, allowing ourselves to evolve and grow through the doing of things and, and practicing yep. it and figuring it out as you go. And we've done a lot of that. We've um we were involved with the Asatru community for quite a while, uh, probably about, uh, not quite a while, maybe wanna, eight wanna. months. And um, we, we, we worked with them because we were looking for guidance on how to, we, in founding a community organization, we wanted to make sure we actually served the community. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for guidance on ways to actually do the service and the Asatru community had some good framework. So we, um, and we knew, to we know Topher. We've, we've, I've done ritual with Topher um, before. So that was a, a nice place to start. But then um, we kind of branched out because that's more um, for people who are online and don't have access to in-person. Mm. 
And we wanted in person, even through COVID, we were, we were focused on when COVID's over, this is what we're doing to get in yeah. person. Yeah. And so, um, and, and it was around that time I was listening to Eric Shervin was like, we need to go this grass, this grassroots route. Yep. And uh, we're members of the troth, but, um, we're not like ambassadors of the troth or right. anything like that. We just support what the troth does and yeah. their excellent literature. Their scholarship mm -hmm. is, is, is yeah. really beyond, beyond compare. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it was, it was something where we're just trying to pull in the good elements of things that we see. And our philosophy is if you're heathen mm -hmm. or you're Asa true or you're Vana true or you're Roka true or you're, or you're um, heathen friendly or heathen light or you're pagan and you don't have a home, then our group is one that can provide you with access to others as long as you're willing to be open and inclusive and um, your, your interest is in the purity of creating something good you're not looking to create something that's divisive yeah. and that's i think one of the hardest parts when you create something like this is especially for those of us in the heathen community you know we have unfortunately some some negative press from some bad apples and we all uh, you know we're forced to take a stand yep. so that we make sure that it's understood what our position is mm -hmm. But then we don't want that to be the totality of what we do. The whole thing oh, yeah. is about the religion. Yeah. yeah. And and you know, I think for me that was what finally pulled me into heathenry after having a dream from Odin that told me, you know, this is where you need to go. And then I was like, it it finally felt like I had that spiritual home, and it felt grounded in antiquity, and it felt it felt like I had the ability to connect with something greater than myself, which I had been looking for, for a long time. And so we just want to give other people that chance to have that experience too. Yeah. And there's no pressure in, in RuneStone. I mean, you, you come and go and, yep. and right. you stay, you grow with us or you go other places. It's, you know, it's just a place to gather resources. Yep. Yeah. And, and I love and, the group, by the and way. Make, make human connections so. well thank yeah. you i know i'm i love that you're part of it <laughs> i appreciate the invite and uh or, or pointing me in the direction because you know from from your and my uh initial email and you, you kind of you know laid it all out and introduced yourselves um offered the the rune stone heathens group i was like yeah sure i'll check it out i mean why not you know um and it's honestly you know i've only been in there just for like the last week or so and still kind of scrolling through and seeing really, really cool stuff. I mean, all of the the educational uh, content, some of the people that are engaging in there freely uh, sharing their own UPG, which I think mm -hmm. is very important nowadays to, to dissimulate the differences between, you know, source material and UPG and to not discount UPG. It shouldn't yeah, be discouraged and it shouldn't be discounted. Um, there, there, there's so much of what we experience day to day um, with our individual cultic practices in our homes, as well as when we share ritual with others, right? That is is largely, or if not entirely, that UPG moment or experience that is valid, and it makes absolute sense in the moment. And it, and it, and it you know, like I say, it validates what we're looking for, whether it's you know that spirituality, that 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 community, that that place to call home, as it were. Um, so I don't, you know, as long as it's, as long as it's just, you know, we give that disclaimer that, Hey, this is what I think. And this is my UPG. Let it fly is what I say, you know? Yep. And that was another thing that was integral in the foundation of the group was providing resources for people, because if you joined heathen groups previously and you asked a question, <laughs> sometimes you were afraid of how it was going to be perceived, whether you were going to be seen as ignorant or you were yeah. going to be getting 15 different opinions and starting an argument. And we just wanted to give people the basic tools to start for themselves. You know, here's a reading list of books that we know are from safe sources. They right. have good foundational information, but always from there, 
do with it like you said what it what works for you so i think that was intimidating was for a lot of people finding that resource information because if you ask some old school heathen how you learn how to be heathen they're going to tell you to read <laughs> the poetic edda and the sagas <laughs> and you're like okay but there's so but, much more to it than that you know what do like, i do then <laughs> yeah but then what you know i go okay you want me to read you know stuff that's you know a thousand years old that was relevant to the time and that's that's one thing i think that gets lost in all of this is is and you guys um maybe can weigh in on this too from so like Heidi you for instance you were pagan for several decades nearly right mm -hmm. Roger you said you came into this from being as you called it Norse Wiccan for how many for how long uh like, I well I've been pagan all together for about six years okay and so heathen for right around three and I spent the first three uh Wiccan and okay. really studying the crap out of tarot as a mystery tradition. So. Okay. So, you know, you've got, you know, collectively, you've got nearly, you know, four decades worth of, of non-traditional religious beliefs or practices, right? And uh, all of which are rooted in different things and, and have backgrounds in different, you know, different areas, different times. Um, but my whole thing is like, you know, we are modern pagans we are we are practicing many of us old ways in modern times so you get told as a newer pagan or, or as, as a newbie or somebody coming into this you know they get told to go back and they get told to read all these things that are uh maybe a bit archaic or, or don't have relevancy they're still important because they they, they lay the framework they lay the foundation down I, th I still think some of these things are important but they don't have any like where do you where do you apply it? Like why why yeah. is why is the Havamal such a big deal? Right. Well, it, there's 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 words of wisdom. There's there's things that are important for Norse pagans to to take away from in the Havamal. But it's like literally just the scratching of the surface. And why was it important? Why were those things? Why is it so harped upon in the Havamal to be a hospitable guest and a hospitable host? Well, you need to understand the culture. You need to understand that at the time and why things like that were so important so it has to there's relevance to it all and without learning the culture without without getting into understanding what worldviews were like back then you're kind of just you don't you don't have any, it's hard to apply it in a modern context what do you guys think right yeah you you get you you'll get part of it you know cattle die kinsmen die and so one dies oneself You'll, you'll get the things like that when, if you read Havamal with no type of, okay, here's what I'm looking for when I go into this <clears throat> kind of foundation. But then you'll start reading about Odin going into Gunlod's cave and being there and taking the meat of poetry and all these esoteric names and things. So you're not going to have any idea what's going on. So mm -hmm. when it comes to like telling someone brand new who what lore to read, I generally say read the prosetta first before you start getting into the poetry, because then at least you're going to have an idea of who's who and what's what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when it comes to the practical application, um, this is something that I and a lot of people have been talking about recently in our group. The sagas were written centuries ago. Right. A thousand years ago, more than a thousand years ago, the they were practiced. These actions were practiced. And we need to be writing our new sagas mm. because we need to be creating the lore that will be helping the future heathen to practice. So it's time to apply what we've learned and take it forward. That's why, you know, Roger is so passionate about the Scald's path because mm. the skald is the one that's going to be telling our tales. The skald is the one that's going to be writing down what we've done and carrying it forward for the next generations. Yeah. So instead of having a dead lifeless book, that's a book of myth that, that is interpretive, we have a living, breathing faith that grows and changes and expands. And UPG mm -hmm. is absolutely essential. I have a, personal UPG regarding magic in this world today, because I believe if you look at the lore, there's the word ergi, 
and a lot of people have been like hinky about that word. What do, mm -hmm. what does Ergi have to do? My personal UPG, because I am a Freya devotee, is that it refers to the fact that magic is inherently simpler for women to understand. We deal with life and death because we have a womb. We create it mm -hmm. and it comes from us. So we are already in touch with magic simply by our being. And a man, in order to get in touch closer with magic, needs to allow himself to become in touch with that feminine principle. And so I think the word ergi is not so much about something bad and negative as it is opening and embracing the feminine perspective so that you can then be more in touch with your own magic because mm -hmm. magic is not a hammer nailing right. something you, you, into a board. You have to become magic, passive. Magic is fluid. Oh, magic yeah. is something. You have to, you can put out, but you also have to receive. So I look at work with women and helping women to bring magic back to themselves mm -hmm. as our way of bringing magic back into the greater world. As the women learn their magic and they mm -hmm. become more comfortable with their empowerment, they're able to spread it out and we can make real change. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of my passions. That's one of the things. And we have great, wonderful heathen women who've been doing it for, for the past 40 years. Magic. You know, there's Diana Paxson. Patricia LaFavel and, you know, Kari Touring, they have done amazing work Saga for Erickson. the women. Saga Erickson, yes. Amazing work for women. But we need to expand that because it's through the women becoming more comfortable and included in heathenry that heathenry is going to expand because we then can hand it down to our children. So it's, it's essential that we don't just focus on the history but we yeah. focus on the living work and how it's going to move forward it's always the woman that initiates the hero in the lore it is <laughs> you're right to say that yeah no i think i think that's a really good point and it's one of the things that seems to get uh or seems to get uh, buried in the progress of, of i think a lot of newer heathens because you do you see like you mentioned earlier uh heidi this this hyper masculine demographic that is attracted to Germanic heathenry specifically because of the Vikings and the, you know, Odin and Thor and all this macho crap, you know? And yes, like the men were, were the backbone of, of the society. All of the things that made a society function was, you know, largely due to the, the bravery, the courage, the tenacity, the, the, the wit, you know, of, of the men folk. But please don't disregard the fact that at the, when the men were away doing what men were doing, right? The women of the tribes, the women of, of the communities were the ones keeping it all together practically mm -hmm. and hospitably and in and, and all other factions. You know what I mean? Like the, there's I, I, I 100 percent think that there's a, a need to, um, you know, really get in touch with the, the feminine divine and, and the power that there that, that oh. it is there. It, it's, it's not just it's not all like you know, sunshine, rainbows and sunflowers and softness. No, man, I'm talking like there's darkness. There is brutality. There is there is scary shit that goes on that women deal with, you know, and, yep. and that we can learn from. And uh, you guys are something else just to say just Ooh. my my part. It's like, whew. Let's we go. get a kick when people <laughs> say Freya is a love goddess. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah I mean, partially. but <laughs> Right. Well, and, that much. You know, and, and Freya because who is the only goddess who is actually able to keep up with Odin? There is no god that can have a discussion with Odin and put him in his place. Only Frigga. She is the only one who actually challenges him and can win and beat him at his own game. I mean, when you look at the interplay of the two of them, mm -hmm. it's exciting and fun to read the sagas that include the two of them together doing things because you can see the calculating vulva that she is and the way she's yeah. weaving those threads into the tapestry and creating her own pattern. Yeah. So and she, knows, I, I think, she knows the things that even the gods and men don't. 
you know she, right. she's she's got that vision and and let's all not forget too that even odin in his in his wily wit you know goes to the cirrus goes to the volva for questions they're at, to get answers to yeah. things so even he knows you know and 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 we know that he gets uh i think it was in, in locus center where he gets kind of you know ribbed a bit about practicing sather you know and, and yeah and, yeah it's loki yeah yeah <laughs> you were out you know, there so. <laughs> Being a drum on the island of Samsui with the Volvas. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, yeah, and I learned a thing or two. So what, That's right? right. I mean, the, the whole like, and then Heidi, you mentioned it too, like the 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 term ergi is, you know, I think it's only recently gotten any sort of derogatory or negative connotations because of some of the backwards uh, progression. It's not even progression; it's not an advancement. But us as a species, us as, as humans, we we've regressed. We haven't progressed. We've regressed in things and, and seeing men being vulnerable or men having, you know, effeminate ways or, or whatever, like that's not what Ergi means. It's not what it ever meant, um, at least not from what I was understanding. And, and, and some scholars have actually gone into that, the etymological roots of that word. And it's like it, they didn't look as, you know, men that were, you know, uh, homosexual or, or gay or anything like that. That wasn't taboo like kind of just happened right. it was it just you know part of society right. this the stigma this this dogma whatever or the stigma of it has 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 really been the the problem with us as, as a modern species as, as modern humanity and the way we've regressed in this way to to put negative connotations of it. and that's why i think it's great that you guys have a, a community that is you know inclusive because you know you've been pagan now for how many years heidi i mean and you too uh roger uh, at least here in Middle Tennessee, our pagan community is is very colorful. We we have all types of of people from you know the LGBTQs uh, communities, and and we want people to feel welcome and to feel safe mm -hmm. in in what we do, and not to be like, oh no, it's the Vikings doing the Viking thing again and wearing furs and you know bearded rough men that scream and holler, Odin, Thor, ah, 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 right. That can be now that's fun to watch sometimes. I'm not yeah, gonna sure. say I don't seeing the men dress up in their gear. It's a lot of fun to look at, but it isn't everything a, that the no, religion is. No, there's a lot has more a place that, uh, practice yeah. and and uh yeah. de self-development that yeah. goes on than just drinking mead and screaming god names. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean it's it's you know it's the 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 brosa trues are the ones that i call those types you know where that's you know till valhalla this and that like yeah okay whatever yeah i don't want to go to valhalla i don't i don't want <laughs> no. I, I hope that that is not the end for me because i don't want to get up every day and have to keep fighting yeah. <laughs> i want to rest let me go visit hell and and have a have a break exactly. she and i will know each other very well by then anyway because you can't do you can't do magic work in modern day. You can't do Volvo work without working with Hella. So not the Volvo work. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I've actually had a very recent encounter um, with hell from attending a low, another uh, group in our area called the, the Raven moon hearth. They're a Germanic pagan group um, uh, in the Nashville area. And um, every year they have an open event. Um called shadow moot and it usually falls around the mid-october time frame uh and it quite often corresponds to the historical timing of, of winter nights or of eternetter you know mm -hmm. so it, it kind of it's it's a celebration of that it's 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 their version of winter nights but they have they have a hell bloat um uh it, at the in the evening time and this this past year's hell bloat was life changing you know when you oh. when you when you go to this ritual space and you you know see uh and i'm just you know going to speak for myself just seeing what at one point in time were trees you know the wood line transform and take on this royal i don't know chamber of of huts and homes and stuff and just the way that it all changed and you like you're literally in hell in the hall of hell you know what i mean like in hellheim uh puts a lot of things it put a lot of things in perspective for me and in my spirituality and how i 
am advancing as, as a heathen, you know, cause I didn't come into this path and, you know, I don't think any of us have, uh, you know, with this, with this, with the same approaches that we have now back then, you know, however many years ago it was, or however long ago it was, we're not the same pagans. We're not the same heathens, whatever term you want to put it to it. You know, we're not the same people that we were right. back then. We're not practicing the same way as we did back then either. At least I'm not. Nope. No, <laughs> it no. changed. My practices transformed totally. Yeah. yeah. We, um, that we're very complimentary. He is, when he started looking into um, paganism, he looked at it from a very ceremonial magic, high magic perspective. And I have been the hippie one who has always been like, okay, I'm going to cast a spell here here i'm gonna sit my butt down on the ground and my circle is my finger and here we go so we have this good balance between us because he's able to make things feel more holy and more present because of the ceremony that he can sometimes create and i'm able to pull him down and let him realize we don't need any of that all the time that yeah. sometimes all we need is just sitting down and, and touching the earth. And, and I've moved into with that kind of idea, um, working magical charms with, with Galder in verses that I've wrote in, in, uh, the, in the, uh, Norse meters. So for need this log, the Ota Hathor, Galder log. So I, I've taught myself how to write English, english alliterative poetry in those meters so oh, wow. uh, not needing all of the ceremony anymore for like a, a a quick hollowing or or something to change your mindset about just icky darkness that's coming up within you and things like that so hmm. yeah so i'd like to talk about that then uh roger specifically with your um scaldic work you know like or your skaldic practices learning the lyre writing modern english in you know in in poetic meters that are outdated for all intents and purposes you know um where did that start it's, how did how did you yeah uh so how i've kind of arrived at it well the first thing that got me interested in like the uh, alliterative style of Germanic poetry was reading books by Vadolf Gunderson and the way that he would write in alliteration. Um, right now I'm reading Rheingold. It's his uh, fictional series um, that's based in the, in the world of the saga of the Volsons. And a, a lot of that alliteration and poetry is there, and he's really good. So rest in peace, Nightwolf. Um, but so I, I became interested there. So so I started writing that wasn't really in meter, but it was alliteration. Um, well, really, when I became inspired reading his work, I began to write my own poetry uh, in alliterative meter, or not? No, no, not alliterative meter, just alliteration. But I, I uh, met a gentleman uh, through uh, Scott Shell. He's he's a friend of the group. Um, yeah. His name is uh, is Eric Westcoat, and he's got a website uh, called The Eagles Mead. I think is is what it's called, um, or or like the Eagles Gift or something like that. But uh, he he has been doing this writing English poetry in uh, in these old Norse meters for a long time since like 2013 or 14 so i took his work and i took some of my favorite uh uh poetic edda translations mainly i, I like bellows edda that's the that's the poetic one that i like to go to and and then looked at like crawford because jackson crawford's got some really good videos on the old Norse meters. And he's actually got some where he shows you how to write English poetry in old Norse or in the old Norse meters. So I just took those three resources and I studied them. I looked at, okay, so this is, this is for Nithis log. So this is how many syllables a half line has. This is how many, like a, like a, a line, a B line counting syllables and seeing kind of where 
the English meter should kind of fall in between. So for instance, like a Fornethis log line, it should have in English anywhere from about five to seven syllables. Now, doing it in English is not the same as originally in Old Norse because the word order and all of that kind of thing. Um, but there's a difference between like when I when I know I, when I've wrote something and I'm like, that's a good line and I write something and it's like that line needs work because it needs to sound good when you speak it out loud. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of and, and then also like a lot of memorization of the things that I write and also memorization of uh, actual Old Norse. And I'm getting into Old English now and uh, lots of memorization of, you know, verses from the Poetic Edda and figuring out how to how to um, use that ritually. Mm. So and and last thing on this, take like what Einar Selvig does. And this is this was my inspiration for learning to play lyre. Take take like what he does and bring that to the hearth level. So. Meaning like in in the home with people, right? Yes. Yeah. In in the in the kindred group. Yeah. Be so that able, goes. Yeah. yeah. Because like you are uh, like you before the, we started recording, you were talking about how it's it's like creating a family. That's mm -hmm. how our kindred is for us. Our, our kindred is very small and it's chosen family. It's people mm -hmm. that we share things with that are are on a deeper level than what we would do in public. Like we've right. we've been blessed. Our kindred has had the opportunity to do the closing ritual for the past two years for the Dayton Pagan Pride. Um, and so we've had an opportunity to show other pagans who aren't heathen what a heathen bloat kind of looks like. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you get it down to the hearth level, when you're doing it on your kindred level, it's so much more intimate and so many more things can happen. So yeah. he's he's done some beautiful work with his writing though. He's he's got a real gift. From what I've seen in the the Runestone Heathens group, um, because I know Roger, you've shared some um poems. Uh, or recitings of, of of things and i believe it was old english that you were yeah yeah reciting i in. was um which again everybody that listens and watches you know um the the group is going to be linked um so you may be getting some requests to join just to be able to hear roger's stuff maybe um i hope that's all right because i want people to experience yes. it as well i think it's i think it's amazing he has a, he does have a great gift he has a, a wonderful talent that needs to you know be shared with the world um but yeah, I, I you know, I've, I've been asked, um, actually, somebody here in our area who's infatuated with the role of the scald. Um, and, you know, for people that don't know, and, and, and Roger, since this is kind of, you know, in your wheelhouse, maybe you can talk a bit to it. My recollection of the role of the scald, at least in, you know, medieval and, and like the Viking Age in, in those times, was... Uh, they were pretty damn important to the to the point that they would be, you know, invited into royal happenings like they had a very prominent place in society um, because they were the storytellers. They were the ones that in, in a time where people weren't very literate to write down things and whatnot. They were the people that could relay and, and tell, you know, stories of heroes and, and, and kings and, and all this stuff. So, you know, for the kings to have a scald in their court was like check this out you know like it was pretty pretty yeah. big deal right yeah they would they would definitely have been on the payroll mm -hmm. um that that that's that's why a king is called a giver of rings he has to reward his dritons and he rewards his scald as well but but yeah take take for example the original scald uh bragi the god bragi yeah. bodison yeah. bragi ingomli the old you know, it said that he was part of Ragnar Lothbrook's revenue and was or uh, retinue and, and was writing poetry uh, he, like his. I think it's like 12 verses uh, Ragnar's tropa that that he had written. So, uh, uh, yeah, a, a scald could could like make you more than you are. And he could also 
crush you. Mm-hmm. There, 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 there were, uh, there were also a handful of, uh, of female skulls out there too. One that comes to mind, her name was, uh, Yoren. So, uh, yeah, that the, uh, the, the skaldic kind of position in the retinue was one of high honor. He sat close to the king in the hall, so he had an honored seat. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's now also, though, I think that comes from an older uh, an older position. Um, so if you've read Beowulf, mm-hmm. you come across where Unferth challenges Beowulf and mm-hmm. Unther, Unferth is uh, Hrothgar's fool. Right now, that's kind of what survives in the role of a fool in our modern lore, or, or, or it, you know, in the lore that we've got. But I think that comes from an older ritual oratory position where maybe like lineages and deeds would have been recited ritually. Um, and, and this Thule position may have been the counterpart to the male vulva or the female vulva rather. Really? That's an interesting take. I've never heard the comparison between Thule and like witch uh, made. I've always looked as the, I've always looked at the Thule as being sort of kind of like a, uh, regulator or enforcer to the, the rules as it were you know kind of like hey don't don't speak such a big game that you can't back it up and oh by the way i'm going to make sure that everybody knows was you know <laughs> sorry go ahead yeah yeah uh the the it seems that the fool like in in beowulf in particular he said the things that the king was probably thinking so that way the king didn't have to say it and possibly like break Griff. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Wouldn't have been Griff at that point. Right. Um, so, you know, that, that could have even, I could, I could, now this is UPG here. We'll put this out there, but I could, I could definitely see how a fool could serve in that role in challenging people that come to the hall, but also being, a type of a a sage that the king would go to for read. Mm-hmm. I could easily see that. Okay, so that tracks a bit, actually. You know, um, because again, one of the things that would happen, and, and we're talking, you know, um, specifically, you know, so you, you mentioned Beowulf, you know, and and that is a Saxon. That's that's like that's one of like the big ones in terms of lore uh, and and sagas, especially for mainland Germanic heathens, you know, folks that are maybe following a more uh, Anglo-Saxon approach to, to heathenry, I think, is that um, the, 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 the tribal structure or, or the, the way that um, groups are formed uh, quite often in Saxon heathen groups are very uh, warband-like. So they have, a, they have their, you know, they have their Drytons, they have their Thules, they have, you know, this. And then and one of the things that happens that we read about in Beowulf that is a primary source for understanding uh, uh, Sumble is yeah. the 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 giving of uh, bayets or boasts and 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 um, oaths is is not is it's more than just a promise. It's not just I promise to do X Y Z. It's the fact that um, now everybody here is bound by this oath and is responsible in a way because our luck is on the line and and all of these pretty heavy duty things that yeah. um, a fool. Uh, is is absolutely responsible for it because you know here you got you know Beowulf coming here talking about I'm going to kill Grendel and then oh well, a second now big guy you know what about right. this the thing out of the other that you did or didn't do you know you know is you, are you biting off more than you can chew and he challenges the the boast as it were of what you're going to do the fool this- makes sure no miasmic crap makes it into their the well of their stumble yeah yeah. So in that way, understanding the uh, metaphysical workings of Sambal, right? Why Sambal is done a certain way, who has the, 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 the positions that they have, who does what they do, why they do it, understanding all that. Uh, and going back to your analysis of, of the role of the Thule and, and, and what he uh, is responsible for and in, in having that sort of like you say, like a sage or seer kind of role, it tracks, it, it makes logical sense to me i think 
we could deduce that that probably is, is, is maybe more than UPG, but we can get into the semantics of it at a later well, time, I'm but, you know, saying, you know, I, I, I want to, because, you know, I don't know for sure. It seems logical. I've never right. read in, in like, you know, Stephen Pollington or anything like that, but you know, it makes sense. There, there's it's a lot of one. conjecture, educated ch conjecture that probably was so that we have to go with if we're going to reconstruct this thing as fully as we can. Right. Yeah. And it goes back to, I think, again, the type of, you know, heathenry that we're talking about, because uh, it's such a, it's such a regional, it's it's such a region, it was at least such a regionally focused thing, you know, yeah, we're talking Northern Europe as a generalized term, but you got the mainland, and then you've got Scandinavia, which is where, every, I mean, like, they got all that stuff from the mainland. I think is where it originated. I mean, the Germanic tribes were there and then things kind of went north from there. Um, and they had, you know, yes, they had their own living traditions. The, the the Swedish had their indigenous people. The Icelanders had their indigenous people. The Sami, of course, in the, in, in Sweden. But where did it where did it originate from? Where did where did so much of what we have kind of stem from? And then where did it where did it uh blossom you know when it reached iceland when it reached denmark when it reached sweden when it reached all these places you know the swedes did things a little bit different than the norwegians did than the danes right. did than and everybody did you know eventually and the Finns did their own thing entirely <laughs> oh yeah Finland, have, yeah oh yeah <laughs> i have a fascination with the Finns. i i wear a hammer but my hammer is an ukos hammer it's it's not actually a mjolnir it's a an ukos hammer because of my fascination with finland and and the Finnish witches, I love that. <laughs> Uko is pretty close to Thor. Yeah. 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 I'm not too close uh, into the, like the the uh, Finnish lore or, or or that side of things, but I've I've heard um, that there's debate whether or not they they were considered even like a part of the Scandinavian. Their their language group. was not Indo-European, right? So it's kind of. Yeah, they're their own indigenous people. Yeah. Yeah. They did their own That's stuff. Conjecture, but <laughs> Yeah. Which I mean it it does. It goes it goes back to what we're doing now. It's, you know, um and I've said it multiple times, I'll say it again that, you know, what is tradition, right? It's not shouldn't be at least the worship of the ashes. It should be the preservation of fire. So there's these coals that are burning, these embers that are glowing that need to be stoked. And new life needs to be breathed into it. And that's what we as modern heathens should be doing now is, is yes, we know certain things about the past, but the past was, was the past. And, and so let's do things now that are, Heidi, I think you mentioned it before, you know, writing our own sagas um, or telling our own stories and creating our own traditions to be lived here and now for, for the future, for the next generations, you know? something that they can sink their teeth into and, and practically apply. Yeah, that's uh, exactly yeah. it. Can that's say the, it better. The, the yeah. only way to continue this, the only way to perpetuate it is to keep it alive and glowing. I like that idea the, of the coals burning, keeping the coals burning. Yeah, how did you say that again? Uh, we're not uh, preserving ash. Yeah, so but... I, the way I've said it is that tradition is not the worship of ashes. It's the preservation of fire. fire. I like nice. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there you go. Put that into your scaldic meters, and then maybe write a song about that. Maybe I don't know. Like it's <laughs> oh, oh let yeah, it, it's let it become it become immemorial. Now speak it into existence, and you know, put it put it on the on the lyre, as it were, um, live he's, on the wire. He's got some. He's already working on a. An, an epic tale he's got an epic tale that he's been working on the scald's journey the scald's journey yeah so tune in that's too he'll many share, verses to memorize he'll though. share it eventually <laughs> do you have a platform that like for your music and for your scald at work roger like is no. there anywhere that you you know or or will it be i mean because again i get i get excited about stuff like this because for some folks that are maybe interested or that have a bug that they're trying to be you know what i'm saying like i said there's a guy here locally who's 
expressed an interest in in wanting to kind of be a part of us he's like do you guys have room for a scald i'm like i don't know mate sure why not like but what is even like what do you mean by that you know are you going to be you know sitting writing songs are you going to be you know scribing down stories are you going to be keeping a log of stuff like what's the what's the what do you think the scald position is in modern times and how well, does it it's a mix it's a mix of all of what you said i mean for and and in every individual scald is going to have an a, an individual expression of that so as we as we progress and do things like we just built this big shelter that we can do an outdoor yule event in and stay nice. warm and have a fire that keeps us warm and stuff like that so you know something that i could could do potentially is is write a verse about the building of the shelter and then recite that verse in praise of the group when we're there on yule that's an example of how of how that could work within context of what we're doing now but then also you know i i wanted to learn how to play an old instrument so i've been working on that for for a year and have gotten pretty decent at it i still got a long way to go there's people who are way better than me but I, you know i i wouldn't be cadmon in the hall if the if the liar was passed to me i wouldn't run away you know <laughs> so you've only learned this talent the skill within the year a year and some change maybe that's it's impressive really, it's it's not even been quite a year really since he started fully devoting time to it it was after Yule last year that he really started putting time into it. And he has talked about developing, similar to my group with Women With Magic, he would like to develop a group of people, genderless, who are involved in skaldic work because he feels like that's, I'm speaking mm. for him. Yeah. Because you aren't going to say it out loud, but he feels like it's part of his calling is to, help perpetuate that for future so yeah your wow. idea of a, of a place to have all that housed is a good one that i think we need to think about right now it's all on runestone yeah it just goes in a runestone and i i sometimes post what i'm doing in the trove so mm -hmm. so yeah well i would be definitely interested in keeping track of it as 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 much as you're willing to share i'm excited to hear and see it, it grow um, cause what, from what I, what little you shared, what I have seen, it's, I'm, I'm itching for more. Yeah. All right. I, well, it sounds great. I, I mean, it's to give you an example then <laughs> yeah, I'm not going right. to play a liar right now. Cause I got to sit and warm up and stuff and things got like to got to limber up them limbs, right? Them, I, them digits. I really you know? do, and I've not touched it today. So, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll speak a verse that I wrote now. I'm going to make it clear. This is not in any type of old norse meter this is just uh it's basically inspired by spoken word so all right here we go <laughs> mead hall's minstrel mighty word mixer bowden's beer bear bore of blood and of spit hydrighton's dearest dangler's thule in lore old days and highest halls in a world with worms and woven walls there stood the strummer of the tree of streams, stories he told, the scald he was called. Let us not fall from the highest hall of Heorot, nor lose the lore of Lera. So called I am to the cunning craft and carry the staff of the wordsmith's work. Berserks no more, nor Bernie shirts, but the blood finch feeds on dirt frosted flesh. No tales are told to kingly courts, but the clans who the call of Aesir hear. Brew I the beer of Bowden, and pour for the pleasure of the people of Sib. Long may they live. Give do I the prize of gout, and with pleasure I pour a measure of the mightiest mead to men and women who would well receive the water of that wealth. Let Braggy's brew a boon to bars and the beer of boil and big veer flow. I, Eg's ale bearer, am called, scald indeed and sick with scores of the lore of Lothar. A light with ale of Aesir I am. This boy is bound to Bowden, Sone, and Odrerir, the eagle's mead from an Othling's horn. Scald, I am called, and a singer of songs long forgotten, but never lost. Hail. Hail. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, man. You definitely captured my, my attention. Um, that was impressive. 
And the fact like you're just reciting, like um, you know, you've put a lot of work into that, I'm sure, and and you just have it ready to recite, basically uh, on the on the, on a whim, yeah, memorized on the whim, and that's that's an impressive skill as well. I mean, just with everything else that we've got going on in our day to day lives, to to have the the the, the mental fortitude of, of retaining and mem- memorizing the 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 verses. And I like how, because I mean, at the beginning, especially, it seems like you set the tone of this poem through the use of kennings, which I think yeah. is another thing that is important in in at least being a good skull, right? Is is being able to describe something in in ways that you yeah. know, well, you can call me, you know, whatever. It's it's you know golden tears or something. I mean, like, you know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at it, but you golden. get what I'm trying to say. Golden brew of the bee sweat. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Don't get me going. I'll get the woad stirring. <laughs> Stir it up, man. Stir it up. Yeah, get it, get it. Uh, yeah. That was great. How long did Thank it take you. you to come up with that? Uh, that one? Just right now or I, like? I, I, I'm not kidding. <laughs> No, 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 not right. (laughs) He's like, well, that took me like I just spotted out right right now. That was it. No. (laughs) I'm not the heathen Eminem. But basically, uh, that one in particular, a a, a day, a day. I had ran across something on YouTube where somebody was doing something similar to this, some real obscure channel mainly a channel about firefighting, but then there's these couple of videos of him doing scaldic stuff. And it was this spoken word thing that he done, not really in meter, just kind of, you know, word jam on the microphone in the coffee shop kind of thing. And and I'm like, I, I could do that. So, so I I wrote that and uh, I actually basically committed it to memory the same day. Didn't I? Yeah. Wow. So I, I become, Really, honestly, the 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 woad begins to flow, and I become a man obsessed. Mm-hmm. So, so for people that maybe don't know, when you say the when the woad begins to flow, what are you what are you talking about? Like, can you can you elaborate on that for people that are like, what was he talking about here? That is like the okay. So that's like that's like Ansu's. It's the inspiration of of Odin or. Yeah. I would say in my UPG, Bragi, it's the the madness that causes somebody to either go crazy and self-destruct or commit commit deeds of great valor in warfare. Yeah. Um, Woad is one of those things that is is channeled into different types of creation. Um, that's the thing about woad is, is that if, if there's not an outlet for it, it can show up as anger and rage. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, the the thing is is taking it, learning how to crank it down from an 11 to about a six or seven and work with it. I have, um, and And it's a soul part too, like over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to get to is, is, is like the, the older, the, 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 the divine inspiration right. and how things like that are um, like where that inspiration comes from or how I guess triggered uh, could be a word, right? Because um, I have experienced myself and I am by no means comparing what I've done to the likes of a scald you or, or others. Um, because to be honest, like what you did was, was very impressive, but there are times when um, occasions, um, activities can really trigger or stimulate. Maybe is a, is a better word because I think stimulate is probably the better word. What what stimulates us to I don't know exude this sort of woad, as you say, right? Like and in, in to be this sort of thing. Um, different elements, different conditions can stimulate us and i've been i've been stimulated in a way and i'll just find myself sitting there sometimes just like in my mind like almost whispering or or speaking out loud what to what some in in the room with me might uh perceive as like he's insane he's over here just like you know uttering things of of seemingly innate babble Mm -hmm. but there's 
there's purpose to it. There, there's, it's almost like you're, 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 you're getting these, I don't know if it's, if it's been this way for you, but for me, it's in like certain flashes of words or scenarios or stories or things. And you just like, I gotta, I gotta express it and I gotta put it out there. And it, and it becomes kind of like a, a run on yes. sentence of a story that starts somewhere and ends somewhere else. Like, you know, you just yes. go down this sneaky windy path of wherever, and then it becomes this thing. She knows I can identify with that exact absolutely, idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, that I do is like to practice, uh, especially what I've committed to memory. Cause I found that if you don't recite it here and there, these things that you've worked very hard to commit to memory, you'll forget it. So, uh, so one of the things I do is <laughs> that people think I'm a madman, but I'm driving down the road. I ain't on the phone or nothing. I'm in my little old beat up car and I'm just talking, mm-hmm. you know, and, and uh, but, but yes, or it, in the shower. On the, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. He'll be in on the shower the- reciting things and he'll be like, did you hear that? Yes. And he's embarrassed. <laughs> and I'm like, honey, don't be embarrassed. A lot of times it just starts with an idea or like a, I wrote a, a couple of verses in Galdrlog uh, about a month ago for uh, a hollowing that we wanted to do because our ritual was based on on a need fire and this we want this ritual to be a rite of cleansing and hollowing. So to put on top of Galder and on top of our go these hollowing ritual, I wrote this verse to speak for the hollowing too. So take an idea maybe uh maybe a kenning or something comes and then it just all gets kind of fleshed out around that so well so there's one one thing thing, like if you're going to pursue the scaldic path you have to be in the lore you have to have that stuff stirring in your subconscious for you to be able to pull it out and and come up with with things that people are going to like yeah. And that's going to be effective too. Right. So, so you have to have your roots deep in the, in that in that aspect of things, and that's a good that's a good point to make. And I also um, wanted to explore with you real quickly the uh, you know you you have a background in as you mentioned earlier, and we really didn't even approach this in depth. Norse Wiccan or Norse Wicca, but the but the higher magic element. I think that Heidi alluded to that you. Um, found yourself in and now you're in this uh scaldic path there's 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 a reason that it's called spelling i mean you we are weaving words even through speech but especially in i think song or in any of scaldic works like this this is it's captivating it's mesmerizing it's enchanting Mm -hmm. it's casting of spells we are you are when you put letters together and create words you are spelling right but there's a reason why it's called that we are literally casting spells you are capturing the attention of of people that have never seen your face in person through auditory means and through all these other ways and it's it's quite it's magical it, it's yeah. literally magical yeah yeah uh, galder music uh verse song all of it, it changes your your normal consciousness into something else. Therefore, it's magic. Well, and, and when you understand the very basics of magic. Stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, I've seen you with the drum and the jaw harp. You're pretty good at that stuff, man. You're a, you're a damn good drummer. But it's in the same sort of way. And thank you, by the way. I appreciate that. I, it, you know, in, in I think maybe in a similar way, and that's why maybe I can relate to what you're saying in, in, in terms of uh that altered state of consciousness that something like what's again seems just like insane babble or innate babble of of whatever you know you could just be reciting words rhyming kennings whatever the thing that you're doing drumming right it's this rhythmic thing that takes you from i'm here and now i'm there and i'm going and i'm going places and i'm traveling i'm i'm going outside of myself to explore things and it, it's it, uh, you know if anything i think to to your point earlier as you were talking about like you know the skull the fool the the seer and and how they're all connected i, I i'm the lines I'm, I'm starting to connect the dots with it all because it's for some it might just be a song 
Oh, it sounds great. That's very inspiring, right? For others who have gone to other places and have used these types of you know methods to to get there uh there's more to it than just than just that i think you know yeah well heidi you're seeing all the time in your your work so you you can definitely oh yeah but it's it's not it's i think any of us who have the ability to have have honed the ability to enter an altered state of consciousness have done so through different means for me i rock i literally when i'm when i'm working up toward a trance i'm i'm rocking as mm -hmm. i'm doing it and then i start singing but the rocking is is the rhythmic part of it for me that's what really gets me started it, so i think you all it's like you said in the very beginning it is how it works for you you have you are taught the basic premise. Diana Paxson has an amazing book called Transportation, and it gives you the basic keys on how to get to a trance state. But she continually says, customize this for yourself. As you're going through the ex, and, and that's what I teach my women. As you're going through the exercises, you're learning, but make sure that you understand you don't have to stay rigidly with the way this is. And I tell them all the time, it's muscle memory. You're just building up mental muscle memory. You're repeating these steps again and again so that it becomes something that you don't even have to think about anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what that you guys, when you're doing, when you're doing your recitations, it's all to help us get into that altered state and a finely crafted bloat is the same kind of thing because you're weaving the pieces together so that you end up with an ability to have everyone have an altered experience and when it happens it's just chillingly mm. amazing yeah but it doesn't happen every time and that's okay too yeah it's but when it does when it man, works when it clicks when it man yeah. i know like you said with the hell bloat which now yeah. i want to go next year to shadow moot Oh yeah. yeah, I mean it, it's an annual yeah. thing, so you should guys, you guys should come. And I think where you guys are at, if you're, you said south of Dayton, Cincinnati, yes, in that area, yeah, yeah there, the, there was a fellow that came from I don't remember exactly where, but he 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 had like a six to eight hour drive from Ohio somewhere and came for the weekend because they have, at least in the past, you know they've they've made it a a, a camping event, you know, so people come and it's you know, it's on property um, of one of the the hearth members, who, interestingly enough, I believe is their thule. I believe that's his role in the in the in the group. His name is Don, and he's got a nice spread up in Springfield, Tennessee. And people come and they camp out, and that's what my wife and I did. And we spent, you know, we got there Friday and left Sunday, and you know, um, it was it was it was just one of those things where I'm like, you know online heathenry is it's 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 all fun it's all nice it's great it's it's great for sharing of knowledge and making friends long distance but man like that's where heathenry is at man it's it's when you get oh. out there and you put your body on the earth and you you interact with people and you do these types of things you know true yeah we one of the first things that we did as a gathering after we were able to get together for runestone with covid was we did a camp out together we it was we had about 25 people and mostly adults but we had a few children and it was a lot of drumming and a lot of sitting around a fire <laughs> it was it was pretty incredible it, yeah and that's one of the things that we uh we're talking about doing something like that in the spring doing a, a spring event we're, where we have a camping thing so yeah, yeah we were wanting to gather there's a group that that we uh share frith with up in columbus called the mead hall so kevin atherton if you're, you're listening hail to you and your folk up there um but yeah they, they've guided us along the way and we want to have like a a regional like uh like all thing kind of oh you guys too well, yeah. we're we're we had talked about it, so it, it's it's still in that rocking back and forth, bubbling on the stove stage. Same here, same here. We're, yeah. we're finding that we're quickly going to uh, 
end up with more things than we can actually do with and still work because yeah. we've got several festivals that we've been invited to now for next year but i'm definitely going to the one with hell so that one's on the books <laughs> yeah i'm just glad to hear about stuff like this happening in our respective areas man i mean because I hear, I don't know about you guys, but like, especially with, with, with my platforms, you know, a lot of people are like, well, there's nothing going on in my area. I'm like, why not? There's a, there, and if there's not, then, then do like what people like yourselves are doing. If you yeah. can't find a way, then make one. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Make something happen. Do it. It's going to require work. It's not going to happen overnight, but at least plant that seed. Yeah. It, it can happen anywhere. It just starts with that one seed to be planted. And, and then next thing you know, there's there's other people that want to get in on it. And, you know, it, it, it can happen, guys. Like it can it can definitely happen. And it's not going to, you know, you. it's interesting that you said, you know, you guys started the Runestone Heathens the year that COVID hit the world. Yeah. Our tribe basically became, we named our tribe in i think it was at yule january of 2020 two months later everything went up in yeah. flames with covid and we're like okay great now what <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> yeah. so yeah. you know but we had we had enough um we had enough history with our core members that to know that okay well we're just you know on the back burner right now we're just kind of laying low we're simmering we're keeping the fire stoked we're keeping those coals alive we're not letting it go out. And then when this all the thing goes over or whatever, we're going to re, you know, bring it back up. And we've, you know, the middle Tennessee heathens group is over, you know, 500 and some odd people now. And, you know, maybe every couple of months we're having meetups, at least we're trying to, and, you know, there's, there's stuff going on, not just in our area, but in, in neighboring areas. And so the regional presence that heathenry has, has really, uh, made itself known uh yes and which i think is great you know that there's wholesome holistic views on on this and that people are are doing things like your folks are doing to make people feel welcome and, and included and know that it's a safe place to pursue their 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 uh, their spiritual needs their religious needs whatever yeah. you know and just be just be feel welcome you know right that's great that's that's the most important part is making people feel welcome. Cause as you mentioned before, Heidi, you know, like there's, there's this stigma, there's this unfortunate, you know, bad press that heathenry has gotten. So how do we, you know, how do we uh, counteract that? Well, we, we create good press. We, we do things like this where it's, you know, good conversations, people feel welcome and want to know more and, you know, so, you know, for those that are listening and watching today, um, you guys are based out of Southwest Ohio, but the Runestone Heathens group on Facebook is, it's, you know, you got some questions to answer, whatever to join, but it's open to anybody that's, that's curious, right? I mean, it's, it's not yep. just oh, restricted yeah. to the Southwest Ohio, right? Oh, no, we've got members from um, other, other regions, absolutely, because we've got friends from all over who have joined, and we have a pretty robust online presence. We've been doing a series of God conversations over um, Messenger and, and Zoom the past couple of months, and we've got one coming up next week, not this week, but next Wednesday on Frigg. And because it's Mother's Night this month. And so Frigg is our focus this month. Last month we did Odin and the Wild, the Wild Hunt. Hunt. And then mm. Loki before that. Yeah. The Loki one was well attended. <laughs> <laughs> and the one on Hell was very well attended. Yep. yep. <laughs> but That's yeah, awesome. so there are online things for people who don't have access. And then we're always, always happy to help with any kind of advice anyone wants on how to get started because the goal is to just get the information out there so more people can get part be part of it. And we have got a massive library in Runestones, uh, the 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 file the, section. The file section, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's tons, and some of it's rare stuff. So we it was really good files. Yes. So check great. It, so check it out, Jesse. You might. Find yeah, oh, yeah. 
Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be digging around there. You know, I mean, I'm always going to be poking around and, and checking stuff out because, and that's just, and that's the other wonderful thing about modern times, right? Like it, information is so readily available and that's what, that's what cracks me up about people that um, try to act as gatekeepers to all this stuff. Um, it's kind of like, mm-hmm. what? This isn't a closed off religion. Number one, never has been. Right. Um, maybe certain regions had had customs that you know, like. I mean, I remember hearing there were uh, I don't forget if it was uh, the Swedes or the Norwegians, whoever that would literally run people off uh, strangers from their alpha bloat ceremonies because it was a family only thing. And if you were a stranger, you got get out oh, of here. Yeah. Like you weren't welcome. Right. That's different. We're not talking about stuff like that, guys. Like, for instance, I our our our, our winter nights, which you could debate was alpha bloat uh centric focused uh our winter nights our tribes winter nights thing was closed off i didn't even invite my friends that aren't tribe over it was just tribe you know what i mean that's okay you can have stuff like that but ain't all of this other like you know i don't know cancel culture appropriation who do you think you are by wearing this particular thing that or the other like i'm sorry but who are you to even say that like we're not we're not we're not it, it ain't like that guys it, there's it, it's a difference not. between a ritual being closed and a entire culture and religious practice being closed yes this has not been practiced continuously by an indigenous group of people for centuries unlike the sami practices or the practices of the of the indigenous people of this continent you know that's a entirely different thing because they've actively practiced it they have a right to their closed ceremonies we yes. don't we're all learning it new and fresh from archaeological digs that's where we get our info from so we <laughs> yeah. don't have a right to let anyone out of it yeah yeah and i'm glad that we agree on that um it's refreshing and you know it it, it gives people i think a a, a hope you know or, or feeling of hope that oh wow i can explore this more and and not feel like I'm appropriating something. Cause I think a lot of folks, especially people that are new coming into this may feel like they're uh, doing the wrong thing, or maybe I shouldn't be doing this because I don't have the ethnic background or any of that other garbage, you know, like, right. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We want people to, regardless of that, despite that, it doesn't matter. Check it out. Nope. If it feels right to you, if it calls to you for whatever reason, you could say it's the gods calling to you. You could say it's your ancestors speaking to you through, 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 uh, you know, through Orlog, whatever. It's something's touching you, something's reaching you, and you need to act upon it. So call it whatever you want. Yep. Just do something about it. Just act upon it. Yep. I think is the overall message we're trying to to share yeah, here. Yeah. Don't, don't let anything stop you from, from reaching out and, and trying to learn it with people like us, you know, hopefully those people don't run into the assholes out there, but <laughs> I mean, it's a, give it time. I mean, uh, you know, you just, you're, you're, you're bound to hit those, you know, you, you go on enough journeys, you go on enough adventures and you're going to run into bandits along the way. You're going to run into the outlaws. You're going to run into those, the bad guys. Yeah. But we want to it's make sure happen. that we have as much ammo to use against those bandits as they possibly can to keep themselves safe. Yeah. Yep. Arm yourselves appropriately and 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 know where you can, you know, find your safe haven, their shelter yeah. along the way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the most important thing is when people are spanking new, when they go and find groups like like the AFA, that they're they can, they're still at a point where they could potentially be indoctrinated by some of their beliefs. And, uh, you know, that's why we need to be out there and open. So when people are searching like also true heathenry, they don't come across those groups first and mm-hmm. come across the troth and tack and, yeah. and us, and you know, so. Absolutely. Well, I definitely appreciate what, you know, the both of you were doing and, and then the overall, I guess the, the bigger, collective um of you know runestone heathens you know so i know it's not just the two of you but i'm speaking to the two of you no. so i can say that i appreciate you know the approach that you both take and, and then the larger group that you guys have that seems to share the same values and approach to it it's that's refreshing that's great glad that we got a got a chance to to talk about this stuff and get people aware of what's going on in, in your area it's good stuff. Same. Right Absolutely. And if you're ever up this way, you have a place to stay. You're welcome. 
Well, thank you. And uh, same, same down here. You know, if you ever, you know, the, the whole shadow moot thing, that's a, they, in Raven Moon Hearth, I'll be sure to share um, with you guys, you know, stuff you can find them on Facebook too, but they have, they have a summer time thing called Suna Bloat, which is usually like in June. And then they have a shadow moot in the, in the October timeframe. Those are all public events, you know, so those are things that are open to people from anywhere and everywhere that, you know, as far as you're willing to travel, just they're, 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 they're welcoming. Um, so definitely check them out. And so, yeah, if you ever find yourself down in this area, you know, our hall is open for you. So Hell yeah. thank you. But if you don't mind, I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, I think we covered a lot of great things. Is there anything else that we miss? Anything that that was that in the back of your minds that I didn't cover that you'd like to say before I wrap it up? And when I do, don't go anywhere. I want to touch base with you offline, but I do wrap things up for the people listening and watching. So is there anything that I missed? Anything else that you want to share? Nothing that that uh, we can't talk about the next time we come on. <laughs> I go. like that. I like that. The, <laughs> the next time you come on, then there will be a next time. I, I love to hear that people want to come back, you know, on stuff like this, because I think there's there's so much that we can talk about that, you know, we, we could go on for hours. And so it's it's refreshing. I'm, I'm would have be, would be happy to have you back on. Thanks. Right on. Yeah. All right. So for everybody that is listening and watching today, thank you for your support. Don't forget to check the link tree link in the description and show notes of this podcast for all the ways that you can support the podcast and Midgard Musings as a whole. In the description and show notes will also be uh, the Runestone Heathens group on Facebook for you to check out. And anything that is forthcoming, uh, any new developments on stuff, I'm sure we'll get Roger and uh, and Heidi back on here to talk about it. So for anyone that's not on the social media platforms that they are on, you know, just stay tuned here on this podcast for ways that you can follow and, and stay in touch with what they're doing. So hail to all my listeners, supporters, patrons, viewers, subscribers. If you like this video, please be sure to like it and uh, share it around. If you're listening to this on the podcast platforms, upvote it, engage in any sort of way that those algorithm gods tend to want to engage with you, engage them back, engage in that gifting cycle. And until we talk again, May the gods continue to notice you, and may your ancestors smile upon you. <laughs>